Hello and welcome to the second part of the pulmonary function testing lecture. Uh, the first lecture that we went over, if you haven't watched already, make sure to go over to that one, pretty much just describes what a restrictive effect is and how it is low volumes and how those patients have trouble breathing in. And then an obstructive effect is uh, the ability, inability to get gas to move very fast. It's like a kinked garden hose, right? Not a lot of water will come out at the end of it because it's obstructing the flow. Uh, so same thing there. When we look at obstructive lung disease, it's decreasing the ability for gas to flow into, but especially out of the lungs because they remember the airways get smaller when you exhale versus when you inhale. So obstructive diseases usually are a harder time to get gas out, and that's why they can lead to gas buildup in what we call air trapping or auto peep in there. Uh, so that's something to be aware of. So if you haven't watched that lecture or don't have those concepts down quite yet, be be sure to go back over those. This next part here we'll be talking about the equipment that we use to measure pulmonary function testing, how we predict normals, uh, and we'll go into that basic stuff again. So we're going to build on top of that previous lecture. So let's get started. Uh, first thing first, when we're looking at most pulmonary function equipment and even mechanical ventilators now, uh, most of them use some form of pneumotachometer. So pneumotachometer, I know, fancy word there, but it's an important word to know because it's a device that measures flow and it will convert it to a volume reading. So when we're doing this, and I have that little YouTube video there to watch, um, so make sure you click on that in your own time as well. But uh, when we're looking at a pneumotachometer, it's seeing how fast the gas moves and then by how much gas moved past it, then it also measures a volume uh, in that situation. So when we're looking at this, a pneumotachometer is the device that the person's blowing into, right? It's the, the machine being able to read both how fast the gas is and how much volume the patient was able to exhale totally. So that is what a pneumotachometer is. It's the device that they're blowing into that's measuring how fast and how much the patient is breathing. Uh, we use, uh, when we're looking at uh, bedside equipment, uh, we have uh, bedside equipment that we can bring to someone's bedside and we'll practice with that in the class as well, uh, where we can take it to someone's room and do a bedside pulmonary function testing. A lot of these are going to be digital now, uh, same technology with the pneumotac. Uh, it's going to measure both the volume and the speed at which they breathe so we can get those numbers. And then there's something called body plasmography, and here's that fancy fancy word, body plasmography. And that's where we put them in a, another form of this is called the body box, right? So it sounds very uh, unique and I have some pictures on later on here, but the body box, we're gonna put them in there and we can do PFT measurements uh, without closing the door. But when we're trying to look at specific volumes or specific tests, we'll close the door and we know the volume and we know the pressure inside of that little like looks like an old phone booth thing some of you may not know what that is but we know the volume and pressure inside of there and therefore what's left over is the volume and pressure that's in the patient's lungs so we can actually tell better what their total lung capacity is we can tell better what they can actually inhale and exhale right their total volume because there's a part of your lung volume, this goes back to pulmonary AMP, that we can't exhale. That's that residual volume, right? You can't exhale that. Well, how do we know what your total lung capacity is if you can't exhale your total lung capacity? Well, that's where we can use Boyle's Law and see, hey, if I know the volume of a box and I know the pressure of the box and then I put you in the box and have you breathe in certain ways, then I can tell what your volume and your pressure is overall, right? So that can help us out. When we're looking at this over here is a picture of what's called a three liter, three liter syringe, right? Uh, how do we calibrate the, the PFT equipment? Sometimes they have auto calibration parts to them. It just depends on what equipment uh, the company has that you're gonna be doing these with. But uh, the three liter super syringe is pretty standard out there. They do ask about this on the boards. Um, but it's a three liter syringe. It looks just like that. And we have one at the campus. So you can uh, look at it and use it and we can use it to calibrate. Uh, but how do we calibrate to make sure 
that the equipment is functioning right before we do a pulmonary function test because it's important that we're accurate with these things. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this three liter syringe and we're going to use it at three different flow rates. We're going to do a slow, medium, and fast flow rate. So we're going to pull it out, push it all the way in slowly. Then we're going to pull out, push it in a little bit faster. Then we're going to pull out, push it in even faster. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that our pneumotachometer is in calibration to different flow rates. So that way we'll get accurate values. That means that we're not gonna miss, accidentally misdiagnose a patient or something like that. So that's a pretty important thing. Uh, like I said, there are other calibration devices and we can talk about those as well, but this is the first one that we'll introduce to you is the three liter super syringe. There's also, going next on the list, what's called the rotometer. Rotometer, it's a flow generating device. So instead of you generating the flow by pushing and pulling the plunger on this super syringe, uh, it's a better method for reproducing flow rates because it's automatic. It doesn't rely on human power, if you will. Uh, so that's the advantage of that one. It's called a rotometer. Uh, if you see this next one here, it's called a sine wave rotary pump a sine wave rotary pump, and this will simulate flows used during a specific uh, test called the MVV, the Maximum Voluntary Ventilation, all right? So this is where we have patient breathe really fast, really deep, we'll go into detail. So the sine wave rotary pump is good for calibrating for that test, uh, and as well as for body box calibration. So it's a good device for that type of thing. And then the last one that we'll talk about here is called the Explosive Decompression Devices. And this simulates flow patterns of a forced expiratory maneuver right when you tell someone take a deep breath in and blow out as hard as you can right really hard that's what this device simulates it's simulating a person doing it uh, in the old school way of doing it uh, in the PFT lab we would do what's called biological analogs which means fancy word for you doing a PFT on your coworker and then your coworker doing a PFT on you and we're just trying to see okay make sure that we were in this case the explosive decompressive device right we were the person to simulate that forced expiratory maneuver and make sure the equipment is within calibration. So once a month, we would do a PFT on each other uh, uh, just to sort of simulate that because we did not have an explosive decompression device. So therefore, we had each other, right? We use community there. So the big one here, all right, make sure to summarize this slide. Pneumotachometers measure both the speed of gas as well as the volume of gas. Uh, we use a three liter super syringe at three flow rates, slow, medium, and fast, to traditionally calibrate most pneumotachometers. However, there are other devices such as rotometers, sine wave rotary pumps, and explosive decompressive devices. And all three of those other ones besides the super syringe have their place, right? You're not gonna use an explosive decompressive device uh, for reproducing uh, 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 MVV maneuver or body box calibration, right? So you got to know what they're there for. So when you go out to clinicals, when you go out to, if you plan on working in one of these places, that way you know uh, what these different ways of calibration are. And it, it is required uh, that these uh, machines or whatever equipment that you're going to use is calibrated the, before you do the PFTs for that day. So if you show up to the PFT lab, you'll see whichever pulmonary function technologist, uh, the respiratory therapist, uh, you'll see them calibrate that machine at the beginning of the day. Then we're gonna record that calibration or the machine records that calibration to show that everything was uh, accurate for that patient that came in afterwards. So first thing before you do a PFT on a patient is make sure the equipment is calibrated for that day, right? If it was calibrated yesterday, no good, right? If it's calibrated today, then you can do it, right? But make sure it's calibrated for that day. All right, the first one that we'll talk about here is body box. This equipment, it's not something you take from patient room to patient room, although that would be very interesting. Uh, the body box is something where the patient comes to you or you go grab the patient in the wheelchair and bring them in, right? Um, the patient comes to you. And what we do here is this is based on Boyle's Law. So if you're filling this in, right? Put in Boyle's Law. There you go. Good old Boyle's Law that states that pressure and volume vary inversely 
where temperature is constant. So what we're going to do here is we know the, t the pressure, right? We know the airway pressure. We know the chamber pressure. Uh, so if pressure and volume vary inversely, then we can figure out what someone's lung capacity is because we have this little shutter up here that tells us the patient's airway pressure. And here's the shutter, if you see that right there. And it's going to tell us the airway pressure versus the chamber pressure. So therefore, anything left over is in the patient's lungs. And so we can see what the patient's total lung capacity is or what's their the a maximum amount of volume that their lungs can hold. So it gives us that good value. If someone's total lung capacity is 120%, if it's a 160%, if it's 200% of what's predicted for their high age gender, then we're going to understand that that could be a process like air trapping that we see in COPD, asthma, emphysema, right? So that's something that we can use to see, okay, now we can measure that, hey, their lungs are getting really stretched out. And that's a, a sign that that could be bad. Uh, and we can quantify that. We can see how much it's changing, how much different from normal it is for someone of that same high age gender, right? And then it does race, it does all this other stuff in there as well to make sure we got the most accurate information for that patient. And then we can trend that data too. If they come in again in six months or they come in again every year, year and they just do a PFT yearly or quarterly, whatever it is that they come in, we can trend that data to see if their pulmonary function is getting better or worse. If they have more volume and more volume and more volume and it's getting worse and worse and worse, maybe we need to be more aggressive about our disease management techniques, right? So it's great. The body box, what does it measure? Well, it measures total lung capacity and functional residual capacity. With both of these, if these are increased, that means that that could be a sign of air trapping. That means just like your obstructive diseases, COPD, emphysema, asthma, if it's uncontrolled, right? It could be a sign of uh, that air trapping. And typically we see this with your COPD patient population, your emphysema, chronic bronchitis, uh, that type of patient population. Uh, the other thing that the body box measures besides those obstructive issues with uh, air trapping is it also measures airway resistance. Well, remember, air resistance is also looking at obstructive lung disease. It's, it's how much resistance there is to gas flowing in and out. So if I have something stuck in the trachea, right, if I have something stuck in the trachea, there's going to be a lot of resistance to gas flowing past that obstruction. So it looks at airway resistance. What if it's something with vocal cord dysfunction? Well, same thing. If we have the part of the vocal cord spasmed and in the middle of the airway, then it's going to increase the resistance to breathe. It's going to make it harder for gas to go into and out of their lungs, right? So not only can it tell us about volumes if someone's hyper expanded, like stretched out with COPD emphysema, but it can also tell us about airway resistance and we can trend that airway resistance in there. So what this device uses, and you'll see it up here, is a pneumotachometer. That's what this patient is breathing into in that picture, a pneumotachometer. Uh, and the pneumotachometer measures flows for airway resistance. Uh, what's the calculation for airway resistance again? It should be, hey, there's a hint, airway pressure. So it's pressure over flow in liters per second, right? So once again, bringing you back to pulmonary ANP, it sounds like that class helped set you up for this, right? Uh, so we're looking at the airway pressure versus how fast they can blow. Uh, and that's what we see. So we can see what their airway resistance is. So it gives us a numerical value. Now, will mechanical ventilators do this too? Absolutely. They give you airway resistance. They measure pressure. They measure flow. Uh, or we're, in some cases, we're providing the flow rate or the flow rate's variable. It just depends on the mode on the machine. But we also look at this even on mechanically ventilated patients. So if you're like, Derek, I'll never need to know what airway resistance is. The answer is false, you you will. Uh, so it matters if you work in acute care, long-term acute care, uh, home care, right? Wherever you're working, pulmonary diagnostics, uh, it matters. Even if you're working sleep, uh, it matters because air resistance with people that obstruct their airways, that's a thing that matters, right? And that's one of your primary things you're working on with obstructive apnea. So yes, airway resistance will not go away. It is part of what we do. We're, we're trying to look at it and negate it and quantify it, right? So those are all things that we need to look at.
Uh, what does it do uh, to measure total lung capacity? Well, it has this little shutter that closes, and that's what we see up here. Look at the shutter, right? I'm drawing an arrow to it, right? There's that shutter, and you see a little thing that will close, and therefore the patient uh, will, it'll trap that gas, right? And then it measures their total lung capacity, right? So it knows the volume and the pressure of the chamber, right, the box, and then it looks at the airway pressure, and then it understands, hey, based upon Boyle's law, hey, that's what their total lung volume or their total lung capacity is. Well, okay, that sounds great, Derek. Why don't we use the, the body box all the time? Like, is there any situation where we won't use it? Of course, there are situations where we won't use it. Uh, if a person is unable to enter the box, um, so that could be due to size limitations as well. We see those patients that might have a significant body habitus or uh, extreme tall or whatever it is that we see. Uh, it, those can be limiting factors to it. Other limiting factors uh, could be patients that have uh, claustrophobia issues. Um, that can be a big issue as well if a patient do, isn't able to do that. We have other routes to measure those things, which I'll talk about in a second here. So claustrophobia, unable to enter the box, so physiological constraints, whether they be uh, uh, bones, right, they have poor knees, poor, right, they can't get into the box for some reason or another, they're wheelchair bound, right, uh, there are a bunch of situations, whether it's body habitus or other, right, uh, uh, that can restrict that, um, that from being a part of their ability to get that test done. So we have other methods to measure TLC besides the body box. Um, and then if they're unable to pant or unable to follow instructions, that would also be a disadvantage to it because when they do this, they do have to pant on the mouthpiece to give us airway resistance. And I have a video and I have a, a page in your Blackboard of a QR code that shows this as well. Uh, that has a link to a video that shows uh, this procedure being done. So if they're unable to do the procedure, if they're unable to follow instructions, which we talked about that in the first video about the contraindications of people can't follow directions, uh, if they're unable to follow directions, right, uh, then that's one of those big things that we, we can't do it there. Now, how is this box calibrated? Well, we're going to look at making sure that the mouth pressure is calibrated. How do you calibrate pressure with a barometer? This is on the boards, right? A barometer measures pressure, right? We're gonna look at box pressure, which would be your sine wave rotary pump. Hey, right, we talked about that just in the slide before. And then finally, we can use a rotometer for the pneumo tachometer. In other words, it'll do it itself instead of us using a three liter super syringe, right? So how is this box calibrated? You need a barometer, a sine wave rotary pump, and a rotometer, right? A rotometer. Uh, now, what happens if a person is unable to use the body box? Let's say they're wheelchair bound, uh, like a spinal cord injury patient or something like that. So there are three alternate ways to do this. We have what's called a nitrogen washout. So nitrogen washout, nitrogen washout. Uh, so this is where we're going to have the patient breathe. Uh, you should be writing this down, by the way. Uh, that we're going to have the patient breathe 100% oxygen, and we're going to measure how much nitrogen that they're exhaling until they get to a certain level. Once they get to that certain level, we're going to look at how much volume it took for them to get to that concentration, that low level of concentration. So then we can see what their total lung capacity is. So there's the nitrogen washout. Uh, the next one, much more fun. Well, they're all fun to me. So there's the helium dilution, right? The helium dilution. Uh, the helium dilution, same thing. We're going to have them breathe in a certain concentration of helium until it reaches equilibrium. Uh, and then we're going to look at how much volume it took to get there. And that will tell us the amount that they have going on there. So the nitrogen washout, the helium dilution uh, are going to be the two other ones besides that, the body box uh, that you can do as well. There's another one out there where you can do the x-ray uh, or a CT scan. 
uh, I think it's called planar geometry, uh, where they can actually look at volume and capacities based upon someone's chest x-ray, where they use mathematical models uh, to figure out their total lung capacity from there. So they'll have an x-ray or a CT scan taken with a deep breath and holding it, and then they'll try to use their geometry uh, to figure out that. So body box, helium dilution, nitrogen washout, those are three different ways that we can look at uh, someone's total lung capacity. So if someone's unable to enter the box, we have alternate methods to also look at these. So make sure that you understand that the body box or body plasmography, same thing, is based on Boyle's law, pressure and volume vary inversely. Body box advantages, it measures TLC and FRC. It measures airway resistance. Uh, it has a shutter that closes to measure total lung capacity. Uh, disadvantage, uh, people can't enter the box, like we talked about with spinal cord injuries, significant body habitus, whatever it is, claustrophobia. Uh, if they can't follow directions, those would be big disadvantages. You do have to calibrate it just like any other PFT equipment. This one will need a barometer, a sine wave rotary pump, and a rotometer to calibrate it. If we can't have a patient enter the body box and we still need to measure total lung capacity, then we have nitrogen washout or helium dilution as other methods that we can utilize as well. Right, and this is just another picture. Hopefully this picture helps out a little bit here. And this is what you're seeing with the airway pressure and the chamber pressure. And this is just a better close-up vi vi visualization of that shutter right that will close and then the patient will pant and then we can look at raw and then we can look at uh, the total lung capacity as well uh, so that way we can measure functional residual capacity because we have atmospheric pressure times the change in volume over the change in pressure will give us their functional residual capacity do you need to memorize that i would say not for my class but uh, that's how it does it. If you're like, Derek, how does it do it? There you go. And I just think this is a better zoomed in picture of it. Let's look at one more picture. So this is yet another picture. So what we're seeing here is what happens on inspiration versus expiration. So when we have the patient breathe in here, here we're looking at box pressure and time. And so we're going to have the patient breathe and then we're going to have them uh, when they exhale, right, there's going to be a flow signal that becomes positive, and that's what we see down here, right, flow signal that becomes positive, uh, and then the Bach pressure will become negative, right, and so that's what we see changing with the Bach pre box pressure and flow. Uh, so the box pressure is changing positive to negative, positive to negative, positive to negative, and so that's what's changing there. And then when the patient's inhaling, the flow signal is negative during the inspiration. The Bach pressure will be positive. So it's looking at that change of that thoracic space. Look at this compared to this, right? It's looking at that change. And therefore, this is just, once again, another way to look at box pressure, right, and flow rate. So here is where that box pressure closes. The patient pants. That shutter will close right here. They're in, inhaling, right? We're looking at this graph down here. Here they're inhaling. Uh, we're looking at the pressure at the mouth and the pressure at the box. And then we see these changes. And these changes will be their vital capacity plus when that sh after that shutter closes and opens, we'll see those big changes. And that will tell us not only their air resistance, but also their lung capacity. All right, so these are animations. But what does the thing actually look like? So here are some just images of what a body box might look like here. Uh, they have di there's different versions of them out there. So not all body boxes will look 100% the same, but this is what you'll see here. Here the patient gets in there. You close the little door latch there. Uh, you pretend you can't hear anything they're saying. No, I'm just joking on that one, right? No, uh, so you close the door and you wait for it to calibrate uh, to that pressure and that temperature and volume, of course. And then you're going to have them perform the breathing technique uh, for the test that we'll do. Well, the next question I automatically have for you is, can you do this with kids, with pediatrics? Let's say I have a seven-year-old. Uh, can I put them in a body box and look at their total lung capacity and trend things like uh, their obstructive airway diseases and look at their raw? Well, of course you can. So here is a good picture of a pediatric patient doing the body box. And here you'll also see this kid wearing nose clips. 
Well, why would you have someone wear nose clips other than just the embarrassment factor? No, uh, the nose clips make sure that no gas is escaping through their nose or their nasal pharynx during the whole procedure. So that means all gas is going through the mouthpiece, through the pneumotachometer, so we can measure their pressures and their flow rates and their volumes, right? So we understand everything that's going on there. So the nose clips help with accuracy. So there's a lot of PFT labs that will require nose clips for the patients as they're doing the procedures. Uh, that once again, that just helps from any gas escaping or being entrained either way through the nose. So that way all the gas is moving is just through the mouth, through the mouthpiece only. Because if you're breathing through your nose through both of these uh, inhale, exhale, you're losing volume, you're losing pressure, right? You're losing flow rate. Uh, so that can change a bunch of things. So therefore, that's why nose clips uh, are very, very standard in the world of pulmonary function testing. So pediatric patients can do body box, as you see here. Uh, big changes is they might have to do something like, hey, add a little footstool in there for that kid or something like that. So you'll see those changes out there as well. So we've talked about body plasmography. We talked about if they can't use body plasmography, how we can use nitrogen washout, helium dilution, uh, and how we there's even the x-ray or the radiology option as well. Uh, what else can we use uh, that's not a body box? Uh, and uh, we can use a new tachometer at, at bedside as well, which we have some of those little ones at bedside. They can't measure TLC though, right? They're gonna measure basic spirometry. Well, what about someone that just has asthma? Let's say someone is just has asthma. Do we need to necessarily measure their volumes uh, and flow rates and all this other stuff? Do we need to do a complete PFT that measures MVB and measures all these other things, DLCOs? Do we need to do that uh, every day for that patient? No. One thing we can do that helps with disease management is to do something like peak flow meter testing. And one of the cool things about peak flow meter testing is they can do this at home, we can do this at the hospital, we could do this in any, any area, they could do this at school if they want to. And all this is is a way for them to monitor how fast they can exhale at any given point in any place. So what's the big thing with asthma? Well, it's the speed at which they can exhale. Okay, so do I need a big fancy computer PFT machine for that if we're just measuring the speed of exhale? No, not necessarily. We have something called a peak flow meter and some of you may already be familiar with peak flow meters. Uh, this device, very simple, no electronics. There are electronic versions out there as well. But all you're doing here is you're having the patient take a deep breath in and then they're gonna exhale in, exhale as forcibly as fast as they can like they're blowing out a hundred candles, right? They're gonna force that breath out into this peak flow meter device. And then what happens is this little red thing here is going to move down and it's going to measure how fast they were able to blow through that device. Remember, with obstructive airs, airways disease like asthma, we are looking at how fast someone can blow out. So this is perfect device to see if, if their lungs are normal, if they're having a good day, or if they need to take a bronchodilator, or if they need to uh, do more of their rescue medications, right? So it's a good way of quantifying for them uh, what their next point of care needs to be. Continue on, uh, continue on with caution and maybe take an extra inhaler that day uh, or go ahead and make sure that you get your, your asthma under control before you go any further, right? So we're going to have this peak flow meter that we use uh, and it's gonna be one of the best, most portable ways that we can help those patients with asthma control their disease so that way they're not coming in all the time uh, to see us in the hospital or clinics or anything like that. So patient looks at, uh, looks at the peak expiratory flow rate, PEFR is what you see there. Uh, so peak expiratory flow rate, the fastest that they were able to exhale, that's what we're looking at, right? So the whole point of coaching this is they take three, three times that they blow into it at least and then they have to blow as fast and as hard as they can. They can't put their tongue or their lips or anything like that. Their teeth and their lips need to go on the outside of the mouthpiece. You can't stick them in there. Uh, and then they need to blow as hard and as fast as they can. And like I said, the faster they flow, blow into it, the further this little red thing moves and tells us where they're at, where they should be. 
So forcefully exhale. So that's the movable indicator we talked about there. Uh, the peak expiratory flow rate is read directly from the scale. You don't need to convert it. Good news. So if you get one here, like let's say it goes here, then we get 500 liters per second. I think that is, yeah, 500 liters per second. So, uh, or liters per minute or whatever right, that it is. Uh, sorry, 500 liters per minute. So then we, we can see exactly what their flow rate is and we can determine what their baseline is over time. And then we can compare them to their own baseline. Now, let's say you do have asthma. Can you ever get to a normal person's baseline? You may not. Uh, so the question here is, once we find a baseline for a patient, then we set their normal values to their baseline. Once again, once we find a patient's baseline, then we set normal values to their baseline. We don't set normal values to their high age gender after we get their baseline. Once we get their healthy baseline, then we'll set normal values based upon their baseline. I had a patient once uh, in the hospital and she was uh, asthmatic, uh, but she was postpartum. She just delivered a baby and she had some asthma complications with her um, delivery and they were trying to get her to discharge home, but she was never able to get high enough flow rates on her peak flow. So I go in there uh, and I'm just the regular bedside therapist. I wasn't doing pulmonary function lab that day. Uh, and I say, okay, well, it is in your yellow zone, and we'll talk about the red, yellow, green zones later on here, but it was in her yellow zone, so that means it was here, so which is uh, 50 to 80 percent, uh, 50 to 79 percent of predicted, right? So that wasn't where they wanted her to be, and I said, do you have a baseline? Is this your baseline that it's set to? And she's like, no, my baseline is actually lower than what it's set there. Well, what had happened is they set her baseline flow rates, 80% of predicted, based upon someone for her height, age, gender, with normal lungs. However, she doesn't have normal lungs, she has asthmatic lungs. So I said, what's well, your baseline? She's like, well, it's this number. So according to her baseline, she was in her green zone. She was normal. Uh, and so uh, we had, I had asked the, her physician if they wanted to consult pulmonary on the case. Uh, because it wasn't my place, but uh, I asked the physician if they wanted to consult pulmonary. Uh, uh, the pulmonologist came in, I had discussed with the pulmonologist uh, my observations of what I just told you, uh, and that was correct. Once we get a patient's normal baseline, then we go off of their normal baseline. Now, if we don't have a baseline, do we go off of what's perfectly normal for someone that, of that high age gender? Absolutely. But if we don't have um, their baseline, that's what we have to use. If we have their baseline, then you have to go off of their baseline. So that's the big thing there. So make sure if you have a patient and they have a normal baseline that they know of, you're setting their zones based upon their baseline. Uh, if you're setting zones based upon a perfectly normal, healthy person's lungs, uh, they won't ever reach that and it won't give you much valuable information there. All right, there are two available flow rate ranges for these devices. You have a high flow ones and low flow ones. Traditionally, you have one that's pediatric geriatric, right? For those patients of those stages, the pediatric geriatric. And then you have your other ones for your um, uh, teenage to adult, uh, late teenage to adult uh, age there. Uh, so higher flow rate ones versus lower flow rate ones. Uh, accuracy on this one is affected by patient effort. I want you to underline this in your notes, highlight it, start, whatever you need to do. Uh, it's all about patient effort with pulmonary function testing, which means it's all about you coaching them to that maximal patient effort. So as much effort as you can get them to do, that's going to be the primary thing. So you really have to sell it. If you go in there and are a Debbie Downer and an Eeyore and just saying, oh, bother, right? Here you go. Blow into this. It might help, right? That's not going to coach them to their best value, right? You need to be excited about this. This is really good stuff. You get to help someone have a better activity of day of living, have a better symptom-free days, right? The more accurate we are with this, the better it will be overall. So this is where you need to look at this uh, and as a way to really be impactful. Yes, it's not as glorious as you know putting a tube in someone to save their lives or compressing their chest to get their heart running again, 
but uh, it's just as important because it's helping them live their life. It's an amazing thing. So make sure that you're you're coaching them pretty good. So effort's going to be something that you as the technician, as the respiratory therapist, if you're a pulmonary function technologist uh, or a respiratory therapist that's performing this, that's something that you want to put in your notes, right? Uh, your notes for the person that's doing the procedure, patient effort, uh, good effort noted, poor effort noted, right? You want to note the patient's effort. If they barely blew into it, uh, you want the physician or whoever's interpreting it to understand, hey, this person just was not putting in the effort that day. And so they can then interpret that value based upon poor effort. In other words, they might just call instead of diagnosing, misdiagnosing them, they might just go ahead and order for it, uh, the test to be done again in a future date. So effort is the big thing. Effort dependent, effort dependent. Uh, what type of lung process would peak flow rates be used for? Well, we talked about this one. Anything that's obstructive disease, right? And the big one traditionally for this is going to be asthma. We'll look at peak flow rates pre and post uh, nebulizer or inhalers uh, to see if there was much change at all, right? Traditionally, we'd want to see a 12% change in their FEV1% or a 200 ml increase in their volume. This one doesn't look at volume. It looks at flow but uh, we'd want to see that change in their peak flow rates. So this one would be used for obstructive lung disease patients, obstructive lung disease patients. All right, uh, we've talked about normal. How do I know what's normal for me? How do I know what's normal for my patient with their pulmonary function test? Well, we like to look at the upper limit and the lower limit of normal. So usually the upper limit of normal for anything except for FEV 1%, which we'll get into this in a different slide down the road, um, we try to look at uh, their upper limit as being, a uh, we look at it based upon their high age gender, right? And we're trying to look at this based upon uh, what is normal for just everybody that high age, gender, uh, we have race, we have uh, all this other stuff that's in there as well. Uh, so we're trying to make sure that we have accurate values for you for normal limits if you don't have baselines, right? So anything except for FEV 1%, the upper limit of normal is usually 120%. 120% of predicted uh, or 80% for that lower limit. And we're talking about there, uh, anything except for an FEV 1%. So 80% to 120% is normal for most people. So if you get 80% of what other people get for your high age, gender, race, so on and so forth, uh, then that's your, do, your, your lungs are within that normal balance range. So 80 to 120% of predicted. Uh, so we're gonna look at upper limits of normal. Now can like athletes get 120% uh, of predicted? Absolutely, can uh, athletes get more than that? Sure, without air trapping, absolutely. So that's why we look at usually that 80 to 120% of predicted being that average or normal lung function for most of those. What we're gonna do is we're gonna compare the patient's value, what they blew, to a normal value. So how does this work? Well, here's a, here is the example here. So here you see the percent predicted. So we're gonna say that this person is gonna have a measured value over their predicted normal value for someone their high age gender. And then we're just gonna move the decimal over, which is that times 100 part. So, the percent predicted will will with quantity and will quantify the severity of the disease process. So if they're only at 60% of what's predicted for them, we know that's way lower than that 80%. And then that quantifies how severe their lungs are compared to a normal healthy lung for that person's high age, gender, uh, race, uh, weight, category, so on and so forth. So what we're doing here is we're doing that predicted. So here's an example. If I have a predicted value of six liters per minute and the patient only measures 4.7 liters per minute, what is their percent of predicted? So if you do this and you divide it out, this should be about 78% of predicted. So if this person only exhales 78% of what they, what someone their high age, gender, so on and so forth should be, we know that normal is 80% uh, of that number. Uh, so what we're seeing here is this patient's volume 
is lower, so therefore there could be a restrictive process going on, something that's not allowing the lungs to expand, whether it's the tissue or the chest wall, abdomen situation, something's going on where it's not allowing their lungs to expand. So that would be sort of a, an indicator of restrictive disease there. So that's how it's measured. We're gonna look at what's predicted for that patient, and then we're gonna see what the patient got out of it, and then we get a percent predicted. That percent predicted is what we go off of. So this person's volume is 78% of predicted. Normal's 80 to 120%. So obviously if it's lower than 80% of predicted, then that means their volumes are low. So that could be an indicator of a restrictive disease process. All right, what are the degrees of severity, you may ask? Well, here we go. Uh, the degrees of severity. Normal, what I just said there before, 80 to 120% are predicted, except for something called the FEV1%. We'll get there. Don't worry about that right now. But other PFD values, 80 to 120% of normal is what we see. If they have a mild restrictive disease, then let's say it's 70 to 79%. So going back to that previous slide, going back to that previous uh, example that we just did where it was 78% are predicted, that person would have a mild restrictive pathology, right, of some sort. Right now, we can't make diagnosis, but we can see that it is a mild restrictive because of the volumes being restricted, right, because the volume is being low. Uh, if it was 63%, uh, then of course that would be a moderate restriction. If it was a 40, uh, sorry, 54%, it would be a moderately severe. If it was a 40%, then that would be a severe restrictive disease. If it's less than 35%, my heavens, that's a very severe restrictive process. Can I Have I seen that before? Absolutely, right. Uh, so that's something that you'll see out there. That's how we quantify how severe their issue is, okay? So 80 to 120 is normal, except for something called the FEV1%. That's a little bit different. All right, so now we're going to look at FEV1 percent or FEV1 percent. Uh, so when we're looking at this, uh, we're looking at FEV1 without it being uh, without it being compared to, to um, force uh, to um, uh, vital capacity to volume. So uh, if we're looking at FEV1 only, FEV1 means forced expiratory volume at one second. So how much volume you exhaled at one second. So if I tell you, okay, go ahead and try this with me as you're listening to this, take a deep breath in and blow out really fast for one second, right? For one second. And that's what you're measuring. How much volume did you exhale in that one second? That's what this is measuring. It's not comparing it to anything else. It's just saying how much volume were you able to get out in that one second. Um, so just that one second, of course, 80 to 120 is going to be normal. However, uh, when we're going to be looking at this, and your book says a little bit different, uh, we'll talk about that here. Uh, when we compare it, then we're going to look at that being anything greater than 70%. Uh, usually 70 to 85 percent is going to be your normal for your lower limits now. And then your chapter in your EGANS also supports this as well. Uh, mild, right, this would be that lower level. Uh, moderate and then moderately severe, all right. So that's just your FEV1. Now if we look at your FEV1 compared to how much volume you exhaled, so FEV1 to force vital capacity, FEV1 to force vital capacity, uh, that's where we're going to be looking at 70% uh, uh, up to 85%. Now if they get higher than 85%, that's okay as well, but we're hoping that it's above 70%. Uh, so that would be your lower limit of normal. And we'll talk about lower limit of normal, and you might see it in your Blackboard course, uh, the charts that I put in there from the American Thoracic Society as well. So uh, anything above 70% is above the lower limit of normal. That's when we're comparing uh, FEV1 to FVC. So uh, this isn't just in general uh, when we're looking at this. The DLCO will also be, or the diffusion of carbon monoxide, which I already talked about in the other video. Uh, we'll talk about that in more detail in the next lecture. So I've already mentioned this a couple of times. Uh, 
Uh, how do we predict normal? Well, normal for you, for your lungs, unless you have a baseline, unless you already do these at home or at a doctor's office or something like that, uh, normal for baseline depends on your height, your sex, and your age, right? So it depends on those three factors. Are there other factors that we look at that we plug into the machine? Yes, we can plug in body mass or weight, uh, or um, we can also plug in the race or ethnicity in there as well. Uh, those all things will help us get more accurate values. However, high, age, uh, high sex and age are going to be the big ones that help us determine what's going to be normal volumes, capacities, and then what's going to be normal flow rates for you, right? So based upon people of your build that are out there, uh, where are you at? Where do you compare to people of your build out there, right, relatively? So that's what we're going to see. Uh, so here, uh, the old school way of doing it, that's why I have the picture of the Oregon Trail here, how we used to do it. Uh, th this is a uh, picture here over here on the left that you'll see next to the Oregon Trail. is called the Collins Water Seal Spirometer. Oh, it has a rotating uh, rotating graph paper that draws. Uh, it's great. It was a way to measure volumes, and you had to calculate flow, rate, flow rates manually. Can you imagine doing that today? That would be hilarious. Um, but I'm sure people can do it, and people have done it, and we got very accurate values from it. But uh, what we do and what we used to have are what was called nomograms. And these were once very common before those uh, computer things, you know, became popular. So the subsequent slides are going to be a nomogram, and I'll show you how these are used. I just think this is really fun information. So here is a good example of a nomogram. You're going to take the patient's height, you're going to take a ruler or some sort of straight edge, uh, and then you're going to take their height. Uh, and then you're going to uh, draw it to whatever age they are, and then whatever else comes on that straight edge, you're going to follow that. So that'll give you their normal force expiratory flow rate, uh, force expiratory flow rate, FEV 1% of their normal force vital capacity, right? So just comparing their height to their age, and then the gender's up here, right? You see that up there. Uh, so you can see that height, age, gender, right? So all we do is we line up their height their age on the appropriate gender chart, and then that tells us what their normal flow rates and their volume is when we do this. So that's this is an example of what we call a nomogram, right, a nomogram. So I'll do the next one, and you can go back and pause the video before I drew all over it and do yours. Uh, the next one will be female. So here is the female one. So you use it the same way, right? So height, age, gender, here's your height. Uh, let's say there we go, and then let's say they're this age. Well, then wherever else that straight line lands, that's gonna be their FEF 25 to 75%. So small to medium airways. Uh, FEV 1%, so large, uh, uh, how much they can get out that one second. So great for obstructive seas. 200 to 1200, large number, large airways, like your trachea, your bronchi, right? That type of thing. Force vital capacity how much volume they're able to exhale. So that's how we used to tell what your normals were for those values is we'd use a nomogram. So really short, right? I kept it short, but I thought it was kind of interesting to sort of show you how they were able to do this before computers had their algorithms and stuff in there. All right, basic spirometry, basic spirometry. Spirometry measures the amount of air entering and exiting the lungs, amount of air entering or exiting the lungs. So it's looking at the volume of gas, right? Entering and exiting your lungs. Now, now so it looks at volume, right? And that's what we really see up here. That's that picture of volume. I'm showing you something that equates to volume here, if you're watching this. But we wanna look at volume of air your lungs can hold. The lower the volume in your lungs hold, the more likely you have a restrictive process. Uh, it can also measure how fast you can exhale, right? It looks at the speed at which you inhale and exhale, depending which device you're using. So when we're looking at speed, we're looking for obstructive disease. So spirometry looks at volume and speed of breathing. So how fast can you get air in and out and how much volume can you get in and out? 
So both of those together will tell us your pulmonary function. Now we can look at other things too, which we'll talk about in a second, like MVV, which is a best overall that can look at neurologic control, uh, muscle control. Uh, it, it, we can also look at diffusion of carbon monoxide to look at diffusion of gas, uh, those type of things as well. Uh, airway resistance, we've talked about that. But in general, basic spirometry just looks at volume and flow rates. And this is what we can do at a patient's bedside. We don't we just take a little device with us to the bedside and then they breathe into it. Usually it has a laptop connected to it or it's a standalone device. There's many different kinds out there and we'll play with it in the classroom as well. Uh, and so you'll sort of get to experience this basic spirometry, basic bedside spirometry that we can do at the, ba at the patient's bedside or even in the PFT lab without a body box. But basic spirometry is measuring the amount of air entering or exiting as well as the speed of the air entering or exiting to look at restrictive, obstructive, or combined disease pathologies. All right. A little bit of review back in the day. What are the volumes and how many are they? So this goes back to your volume and capacity box. And hopefully you remember this. Hopefully you wrote it down in your study guides, your notes. Um, and however you want to put this together is up to you. Uh, but uh, obviously I didn't draw it to proportion, but uh, this is your volume and capacities that I'm asking you. What are your volumes? Well, there's a bunch of different volumes. And there are, there's not just one volume your lung has, right? It's not just total lung volume or total lung capacity, right? It is a bunch of different volumes. If I inhale a little bit above my tidal volume, right? Tidal volume is your normal breathing. So that's one of them. Number one, tidal volume. Supposed to be a number one. Anyway, uh, one of them is tidal volume, right? And this is the quiet breathing that you're doing right now, unless you're on a treadmill or something like that. Uh, this is that quiet breathing that you're doing now. When we put people on mechanical ventilation, uh, then we put them on tidal volume. That's how we dose most ventilators is using volume based upon that patient's height and gender. Uh, and then we'll change that based upon their lung pathology too. If their lungs have a severe pneumonia, then we know they have a restrictive disease. Can we use a normal tidal volume? Well, if their lungs aren't normal, uh, odds are that if we used a normal tidal volume, we could actually be causing harm and trauma to those lungs. So we might have to decrease it. So that's a whole separate thing that we'll get into when we get there. So tidal volume is one of them. All right, I'm breathing normally, but let's say I take an extra breath in. <gasps> because I have something to say, right? So I take that extra breath in, right? Deep breath in, or I just seen a ghost, right? That little gasp in, right? Uh, then that's above, right? Uh, that's above my normal breath. That's above my tidal volume. And that's called inspiratory reserve volume. Inspiratory reserve volume. That's what you see here. Uh, so that's that little reserve. So if I need to take an extra deep breath in, I can, right? And that's that little reserve that I have above my tidal volume. All right. Now let's say I exhale quietly, but let's say I'm about to cough, right? Uh, sometimes I'll exhale all the way before I cough. Or let's say you're sighing, right? You know, it's like that whole teenager thing. Hey, can you go take out the trash? And you're like, right? And you exhale further than your tidal volume, where you exhale a little bit further, right? That's going to be expiratory reserve volume. ERV. So expiratory reserve volume, it's the amount you can exhale past your tidal volume. Inspiratory reserve volume is the amount you can inhale past your tidal volume. Tidal volume is your quiet breathing, five to seven mLs. Uh, is normal for all land-dwelling mammals uh, that are human. Uh, so when we're looking at five to seven, that's our normal range for all of us, uh, hopefully that are listening to this. Uh, but when you're looking at IRV, it's the amount of volume they can inhale above tidal volume. ERV or expiratory reserve volume is the amount they can exhale below tidal volume. So that's the maximum amount they can exhale. All right. There's one more that's left over that you can never get rid of. And it's called residual volume. 
residual volume, uh, roughly around 20%. There are some sources that say 25%. We'll go with 20% for per my purposes, but 20% uh, of your total lung capacity there. So residual volume is the amount of gas that you cannot exhale. You cannot, right? It is in there. And what, what, why can't you do it? You're like, Derek, I can do anything, right? Well, maybe, uh, but let me give you this information here real quick. Uh, uh, what happens to your rib cage? Does your rib cage collapse completely when you exhale? No, it doesn't. Well, that's a good thing. If your rib cage doesn't collapse completely, that means there's some outward tension or pressure that's keeping your lungs open as you exhale. So yes, do your lungs close when you exhale? Yes, they do, but do they close all the way? No, some air will stay in your lungs. Well, what's the amount of air that stays in your lungs no matter how much you exhale? That's that residual volume. That residual volume is, no matter what, it's because of the rib cage. It's because of the thoracic suction pressure that keeps the alveoli, that keeps the respiratory zone somewhat inflated. It's that residual volume that's left in your conducting airways uh, that's not exhaled all the way, right? So you have some residual volume. So these are your four volumes that you have in your lungs. So tidal volume, quiet breathing. Inspiratory reserve volume, the amount you can take in above a tidal volume. Expiratory reserve volume, the amount you can exhale below a tidal volume. And residual volume, the amount that you cannot exhale unless for some reason all your thoracic cage was busted, right? Something like that's going on. So we went over the four volumes. Now we are going over the four capacities. So what defines a capacity? It sounds like this will be a good MRE question. I'll know if you Google it. <laughs> uh, a capacity is defined. Listen to this, write it down. A capacity is defined as two or more lung volumes. Once again, a capacity is defined as two or more lung volumes. I'll repeat it a third time. A capacity is defined as two or more lung volumes. What in the world does that mean, Derek? All right, well, here we go. I'm gonna do our four volumes. Uh, IRV, tidal volume, ERV, residual volume. Remember the definition is two or more volumes. Okay, uh, what if I did something, let's do something simple. What about this first one down here? All right, total lung capacity, TLC. Total lung capacity. Is this meet that definition? Well, of course, it has two or more volumes and it. it has inspiratory reserve volume, it has tidal volume, it has expiratory reserve volume, it has residual volume. So that does meet the definition of a capacity. Remember, a capacity is two or more volumes, right? So if I were to give you a question down the road, hey, what is uh, IRV plus tidal volume plus ERV plus RV equal? You're going to put the answer as total lung capacity, right? Uh, do they ask you this exact type of thing on the boards? Yes, they do. Uh, I wouldn't be here doing this if I, did, you know, trying to prepare you for that if they didn't. Uh, so that's one thing that they put on there. So total lung capacity is two or more volumes. It's all the volumes together. What about vital capacity? What is this one? Well, let's do this one, and then we'll do this one. Vital capacity is the one that we do most pulmonary function testing with. Vital capacity is the maximum amount of air that you can inhale and exhale. So from a complete inhale, so follow with me. Take a deep breath in right now, as deep as you can. And then exhale all the way, as far as you can. Keep going, keep going. Right, exhale as far as you can until you can't exhale anymore. That's your vital capacity. So you're gonna start at TLC as high as you can, right? As, as deep of a breath as you possibly can. And you're gonna exhale as far as you can. Well, every time we do a pulmonary function test, that's what we're looking at is a vital capacity, right? You do a peak flow rate, we're gonna look at vital capacity because right, we're measuring flow rates, but we're gonna have them do a maximum effort, which would be a vital capacity. 
So most PFTs are based on a vital capacity. Uh, so vital capacity doesn't meet the definition of a capacity. Well, what makes a capacity? Two or more volumes. I'm hearing you repeat to yourself. Uh, well, that means IRV, tidal volume, and ERV, all three of those volumes are included in it. So therefore, it does meet that definition of a capacity, right? Two or more volumes equals that capacity. So this one has ERV plus tidal volume plus IRV. The answer is vital capacity, right? The maximum amount of air you can exhale after a complete inhale. Once again, the maximum amount of air you can exhale after a complete inhale, right? So if I have you take a deep breath in and blow it as far as you can, we're looking at vital capacity. So this one tells us about the volume your lungs can contain, the volume that you can inhale and exhale. And it also, if we measure how fast you do it, can tell us about the speed, right, or flow rates that you do. So it can give us good information about restrictive and obstructive conditions. All right. What is this one? Inspiratory capacity. All right, so here we go. Inspiratory capacity. So this is the amount of air that you have uh, from your tidal volume and IRV together. Do you see that? You see where this box sort of helps? Uh, it helps me a lot for sure. Uh, make sure that I got all these right. Uh, so that means that this is the amount after you exhale your tidal volume, right? Exhale quietly and then take a deep breath in. <gasps> That's your inspiratory capacity. So exhale quietly and then take a deep breath in. So it's the amount of volume or that you can have in your lungs after a resting exhalation. So uh, how much air you can contain uh, for your inspiratory level, right? How much inspiratory level of air you can contain would be another thought to think here. And then finally, well, what's the other side of it? Well, if that's 50% of your total lung capacity, the other 50% would be what's called functional residual capacity, FRC. FRC, and then we'll do residual volume here because you can't exhale that. So FRC would be the other half, the other 50% uh, of you. So if you were to exhale, uh, so if you have a quiet tidal volume, right, and you exhale, uh, how much air we talked about is left in your lungs? Well, that air left in your lungs would be functional residual capacity. Functional residual capacity is how much is left over after the end of a quiet tidal volume breath. So you're inhaling now, you're taking a quiet tidal volume breath out. How much gas is left in your lungs? Well, that's FRC, right? That's 50% of your total lung capacity. So now there are four volumes. Here you go, here are your four volumes. And now there are four capacities, right? So we have four volumes, four capacities. What's the definition of a capacity? <gasps> Two or more volumes, which means FRC is ERV and residual volume combined, ERV and RV combined. So both of those together, FRC is uh, ERV and residual volume combined. Uh, four volumes, four capacities. Uh, we just went over which four they were. Uh, now let me ask you a subsequent question. If someone is air trapping, let's say they have emphysema, uh, uncontrolled asthma, right? What if they have a significant air trapping process? Which capacities would be increased with air trapping? And it goes over this in your Egan's chapter on this as well. Which uh, capacities would be increased in air trapping? Well, is it trouble breathing in or trouble breathing out? So you said trouble breathing out, I'm hoping, right? So that means your FRC would be increased with air trapping. TLC can be increased with air trapping. RV can be in increased with air trapping. So these values, we try to trend their functional residual capacity. If their FRC keeps going up and up and up, that means their air trapping is getting worse and worse and worse. All right, and so that's going to be one of those things that we have to watch and be more aggressive with if we start to see a trend uh, to the point where it's uncontrolled or unexpected trends. So uh, with air trapping, it's going to be the expiratory capacities or the expiratory volumes that would be increased because they're not able to get it out. They're trapping it. So the expiratory capacity, how much is left over in their lungs, is going to increase and increase and increase. And we'll go over a picture of this in uh, is in your blackboard as well as in your book, and we'll go over it in class together as well. So it's hard to imagine just watching this video, but we'll try to go through that together too. 
So they, they can't get gas out. So there's a lot of gas that's left over in their lungs. That's that air trapping we talked. All right, which ones would be decreased with restrictive disorders? This is a great question, I love this. So which volumes and or capacities would be decreased with a restrictive disorder? And you should have said all of them, right? Total lung capacity, inspiratory capacity, IRV, tidal volume, ERV, residual volume, inspiratory capacity, FRC, vital capacity, residual volume, all that stuff, right? I know I just repeated them a bunch of times, but yeah, all of them, right, would be decreased with restrictive because what do you know about restriction? What does it do to your lung volumes? Well, if your lung volumes decrease, what happened to your lung capacity? So, well, they also decrease. So obstructive would have expiratory volumes and capacities increase. Restrictive has all volumes and capacities decrease. So if you have someone do a pulmonary function test and you see that their volumes are all low, that could be a sign of restrictive if it's less than 80% of predicted, right? Unless they have a baseline. But, uh, so you're going to see those volumes below that's a restrictive disease pathology if you see their expiratory volumes and capacities high and their flow rates are low well then we know it's going to be an obstructive disease so there's a little chart that i have on your blackboard and it looks something like this so you're restrictive to volume and you're obstructive to flow all right, and so what I do here is now I look at this. If I say someone has a very low vital capacity, so that I would put that over here. So I'd say, hey, their vital capacity is decreased. Okay, uh, then I'm going to look at their their IRV, their vital capacity is decreased, but their flow rates are normal, right? They're 80 to 120 percent of predicted, or 70 to 100. Uh, percent of predicted if it's a FEV 1%. So let's say their flow rates are all normal. Well, then I know, hey, if their vital capacities are decreased, but their flow rates are normal, we're looking at a restrictive pathology. So is it a pneumonia? Is it pulmonary fibrosis, right? So it can tell us there. Or what if we have another, the same chart, right? Restrictive to volume, obstructive to flow. All right, I look at their vital capacity and it is normal. But then I look at their flow rates and they have decreased flow rates, their peak expiratory flow rate, which we already talked about, is decreased. Well, then I say that, well, this is an obstructive pathology, right? So then we can sort of determine based upon what we're seeing there, uh, who's to blame, what type of disease pathology is going on with this patient. And it's gonna help us determine therapeutic interventions such as pharmacological or mechanical interventions like different devices that could help this patient as well. Or even different programs like pulmonary rehab, uh, things like that as well. So exercise regimens, depending on severity. So you can see here the benefits of knowing volumes and capacities. So we're going to go into this in obviously more detail, but hopefully this gives you a good overview picture of the four volumes for capacities, the definition for a capacity, sounds like that would be a great quiz and exam question, just saying. Uh, but uh, knowing them, knowing what's included in them, what happens with air trapping? Which ones would be increased with obstructive disease? Which ones would be changed with uh, restrictive disease? Which direction would it go with restrictive disease, right? So these are all important factors that once you get these down, like I said, not only will it help you in the world of PFTs if that's where you want to go, but this will also help you in the world of mechanical ventilation if that's where you want to go with it as well. If I know someone has a restrictive process like pneumonia, should I be giving them a normal tidal volume? You could, but are their lungs going to accept a normal volume? No, you could be causing harm because that volume might be too much for their lung pathology, right? So you gotta help them. It, knowing lung pathology is going to help you make safer decisions that won't cause the patient harm, right? It can help you take care of patients more effectively. 
All right, this last one here, this is what's called the spirogram. Here is the spirogram. So this is showing someone breathing, right? And I'll use blue here. Uh, it's showing someone breathing in and out, in and out, in and out. And that's that tidal volume. That's that quiet breathing. Then when we do a pulmonary function test, I'm going to have you take a really deep breath in <gasps> to total lung capacity. So that's your maximum inspiratory level. So here you see the volume and capacity box over here, right? You see that? It doesn't matter what order you put it in, right? Me, I put it in different order, obviously, but uh, you see them breathing at tidal volume. Then you have them breathe up to TLC, and then you have them exhale as far as they possibly can to residual volume, right? There's that residual volume. And once they exhale as completely as much as they can, there should be like a little plateau there. Then they go back to normal tidal volume breathing. So this is what we call the spirogram. It's a picture of what would be a typical forced vital capacity or even a slow vital capacity, right? Where we have them breathe normal, really deep breath in, blow out as hard and as fast as you can for forced vital capacity and then back to normal. So you can sort of see them breathing at the different lung, vo lung volumes there. So that's just superimposed next to the volume and capacity box. So you can sort of see inspiratory reserve volume, right? How your tidal volume is only 10% of your TLC, right? Here we go, tidal volume, 10%. So that means that inspiratory reserve volume is 40%. Do you need to know these percentages for yes? Yes, you do. The answer is yes, you do. All right. Vital capacity is 80% of predicted, which means residual volume is 20%. If this is 80%, then this is 20%. So that would equals 100%, which would be total lung capacity, be 100% of your volumes. Inspiratory capacity, therefore, is 50%, therefore FRC is also 50%. ERV is 30% because remember residual volume is 20%. So ERV is 30% because remember 50% of this is up here uh, and then 50% of this is down there. So do you need to know these percentages? Yes. So what I recommend doing is drawing the volume and capacity box and putting in the percentages and then doing it again and then doing it again and then doing it again, walking away for four minutes, coming back, doing it again, right? Can you recall it from memory? Because I will ask you about those percentages. The boards will ask you pretty much about these percentages in one way or another. So uh, the big thing is just making sure you got those down uh, as well as your volumes and capacities. All right, so hopefully going through this whole presentation, I know it went a little bit long here, uh, helps you understand what equipment we use, pneumotachometers, body box, uh, why we use it to measure volumes and flow rates, uh, we, how do we calibrate them, what equipment do we use to calibrate. Remember we have the sine wave rotary pumps, the explicitly compressive devices, we have the three liter super syringe that we use at three different flow rates, uh, right, so and you see the, what is a nomogram, what is the definition of a capacity, uh, what are my four volumes, what are my four capacities, right, so hopefully you're starting to get a lot of this put together. Uh, so this is only the second lecture. I will do a third lecture that goes into more detail about the specific pulmonary function tests, the procedures that we do as well. So get some time, let this sort of sink in, right, uh, and build upon that first lecture. And I'll see you in the next PowerPoint.